so I, I work in a hospital group um, which is called East Kent Hospitals. It's a big ugly um, trust. Uh, it's got five sites, three acutes, two of which have got A&Es. Uh, we turn over about um, three quarters of a billion pounds. We've got about 1100 beds um, and we employ about eight and a half thousand people. Unfortunately, um, during COVID, our turnover has gone up by 100 million, which we hope the Treasury wouldn't notice, but they've now noticed and asked us if we could have a little think about that. So uh, I work for a big trust. Um, I'm 11 years into post, um, which has flown by. Um, I still understand less than a, you know, you know, I thought I would by this point. Um, background in um, management consultancy, academia. Um, I'm also um, the chair of a group called the Shared Health and Care Analytics Board, which we'll come to. And that if that simply is everyone in the room in Kent and Medway who's interested in data. And we've got a, a quite a strong governance function around that. And as, as Karen suggested, I think um, these things take time to put together. And I think we've got some pretty good relationships here. Um, there's a number of things that we haven't achieved and a number of systems on will probably feel like they're further ahead than we are and they would be right. Um, but I'm just kind of giving you our experience kind of warts and all. So um, role in a hospital, a regional role chair in that group. Uh, I'm also the AI lead um, for the trust um, and I've done a few other bits and pieces over the years as well. Um, we set up a company called Beautiful Information with our trust a couple of, about seven years ago. Um, uh, and then recently during COVID, we've set up a not-for-profit called Open Data Saves Lives. Just so just quick plug for that. Uh, we run sort of free webinars through, uh, we, we ran it through COVID, really interesting. Um, and it was just a sort of a, a challenge to the way that government was moving data around during COVID, which could not wait for the normal processes. So COPE was really well, um, was welcomed. Um, people may, I think most people would be familiar with COPE, but for those not, um, basically during COVID, um, we were allowed to link data more quickly um, if we could demonstrate that there was some, you know, uh, quick knowledge that we would gain that would help us in our fight against COVID. And that gave people a lot of cover to get on with things which you might refer to as secondary uses of data. So one of the debates that we might have is what is secondary use of data and what is direct care? And the lexicon sort of changes around this stuff quite a bit and it's relatively fluid. And I think if if there's anything, if there's, what, there's, if there's a few things you might take away from this, I would think that one of them is that discussion around what we're allowed to do with data and where we're allowed to do it, because that is changing all the time. And you'll have received all the gubbins about federated um, you know, data platforms that's come out from Ming Tang, you'll have the strategy unit going on about how much they know about it all and so on. And there are some big um, decisions to make about where you store your data. One of the wicked problems that I'll list later is about trusted research environments, because that feels as though the Goldacre review is kind of is changing some of the advice around that. So there's some big decisions to think about and wrestle with regionally. Um, and on in the open data saves live stuff, we would we were just quite critical of how things were being done in the government. And I, and I give you an example of that. I'll, I'll try and put some examples in as we go, because I think they're a bit more real. Um, when COVID was very, very difficult through March, April, May, June of 2020, um, we realised that if we could get the COVID test results from yesterday, if someone presented in ED, we would know immediately their COVID status and we would be able to stream them rather than at that moment in time waiting probably an app, probably a day um, to get a COVID result. We knew that that data existed because NHS Digital told everyone that they had it. So we asked for it and said, well, we're a trust. We'd really like to use it. And it was just it was just all too difficult for them. Um, they said, oh, we don't know if we've got it or if we're allowed to give it to you. We think one of the CSUs might have it. Um, trying to contact them or NHS Digital was very difficult. Um, um, then getting told off for embarrassing them on Twitter um, by Director of Comms um, was interesting. Um, but then the next day, someone much more important than someone in comms at NHS IE sort of said, well, we can't really be seen to criticise NHS Digital, but we think what you're doing is 
a great idea. And, and in the end, a chap who works as a public health consultant said, well, I've got this data because I can download it. I'll just email it to you. And so we built an application and we demonstrated that statistically significantly we reduced mortality because we had that new piece of data. And I think one of the points I would make through all of this is that what we're trying to do with data, and I think probably this is a collection of the willing who think that data saves lives and if you bring data together that's a good thing, um, it's quite sensitive and you'll have quite a lot of battles with people and you should not shy away from that. If you can sleep well at night and defend in court what you're doing um, and you believe you're on the side of the angels, then you should just keep going because there will be plenty of people that say it's all a bit too difficult and I'm a bit nervous about doing this, so I don't think I want to do it. And, and that might be one of the messages that you take away from it. That might not sound very practical, but um, one of one one element of it is a sort of a call to arms amongst us as a community to you know share best practice demonstrate really um creative ig um in the case of some work that we did at the beginning of covid when domestic abuse was flagged every sunday on the newspapers as an issue during covid um, we made the ethical case that it would be okay to link data from the police to data from the nhs a classic venn diagram so crudely the police have got a file of men who hit women and I've got a file of women who get hit by men. And surprise, surprise, if you put them together, you can find the wider parts of both of those circles. And again, we demonstrated that the model worked. Um, but you can imagine that that was a quite difficult conversation for people because you 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 sort of wrestling with legal opinions. But you then when you get to the um, information commissioner, you're really talking about making a kind of moral, ethical argument around the use of data. So I'm being sort of slightly deliberately provocative, but just to just to emphasise that these are this is important work, but difficult work for you all. So don't be surprised if it feels like that when you get further into it or, you know, you've probably made more progress than we have. Um, so um, the, the background for us, for better or for worse, we had built something which I think for its time, um, and I think you've all whizzed past us in the fast lane now, but in it, it was relatively uh, new and quite clever at the time. We built a thing called the KID, the KIN Integrated Data Set, um, where we, we developed an anonymous data set, but it brought in data from lots of different places, GPs, um, providers, um, data on housing, data on demographics, uh, data on prescribing, um, and kind of put it all together and that's been really helpful. Um, the centre have used that to calibrate their funding models. Uh, we've got a kind of a background in using that data set for research and that was kind of phase one for us. Um, the second sort of phase or data set is where one of the regions like many on here probably that have got a linked care record now. So if you might work with someone like um, Graphnet or Ryan or, or someone like that, and you've got all the data linked together so that if Karen comes into ED and she's unconscious, we can look up and see her GP data and know that she is allergic to penicillin or um, is this ethnicity or has got these set of social issues that we need to resolve or, or whatever. So very simple direct care application. Once you've linked all that data together, you then in theory, you've got quite a strong secondary use of data data set. Uh, and we have in um, Kent, one of those called the Kent Midway Care Record, um, which is provided by Graphnet and we're part of their national cipher program. Um, and that's quite interesting because it links together data sort of for the first time from all from all of those NHS organisations. Our plans beyond that are more ambitious, actually, um, and that takes us to something which we're calling the kernel. Um, so in in a regional linked data set if you usually people talk about things like bronze silver and gold and bronze might be um, things like provider data silver might be bringing gp data and gold might be bringing in social care data and that's a reasonably sensible model to try and work through um, our public health colleagues on the phone will tell us that the nhs is only responsible for a relatively small percentage of someone's health and all of the kind of wider determinants of health like housing um, education air quality uh, family structure you know all sorts of things are much more important 
And our plans for the kernel, um, which you can you can start to see here as a kind of brand and a sort of fledgling data set, is an aspiration to bring together all of that um, platinum data, we'll call it, um, which is all of that wider determinants of health data, but also a much more clinically um, detailed data set. So I work in a hospital. If Karen's a patient of mine and she was a renal patient, I would know her creatinine score. I'd know her oxygen saturation level, her blood pressure, her use and muse scores. Uh, I would know if she went into theatre, the cut to close rate on the surgery. I would in theory know how much blood we went to get out of the fridge and so on and so on and so on. And the aspiration with the kernel is to bring all of that wider determinants of health data, but also to bring in a lot of clinical data as well. Um, I'll just jump to a slide that just because I'm talking about it makes that a bit clearer and, that, and I'll go back if that's OK. Um, so, yeah, I hope this is this is kind of self-explanatory and and sort of describes some of our aims. So you've got different different sets of data across the top, and those sort of close to gathering data will know that some of those things are quite easy to get, and some of them are quite hard. So on the far left, I work in an acute trust. It's really easy for me to get SUS data because I send it off every month to the centre, and I send it to I'd send it to a CSU if they wanted it. I'd send it to a local data warehouse. That's pretty straightforward. Um, it's more difficult for me to get primary care data, but I can now start to get that through um, the Kent and Medway care record. But I might decide that I wanted more than what's available in the shared care record, and I might go and organise a flow of data through EMIS or Apollo or you know whoever it is that is uh, used in that region. And then across the top, you've got some that are relatively easy and some that are quite hard. Um, so community data, relatively straightforward. CCAM, not too bad. Mental health, not too bad. Social care, a bit harder. Um, at the council, they want a legal opinion on whether to go to the toilet or not, whether to have sugar in their tea. Um, they will wait for the NHS to do more and then they'll join in when they're ready. Um, but, all, but insist all the way through that, that any board is called health and care. So we'll call our board the Shared Health and Care Analytics Board, but they still want health to link all of the data before care data comes in. So there's politics in this to navigate as well. Um, and I gave an example earlier about um, domestic abuse data, really, really sensitive. And I am, um, you know, there, there exists on the internet footage of me having a hell of a row with someone who didn't agree that that was an appropriate thing to do. Um, fire and rescue is quite an interesting data set. Um, there's, there's there's less serious fires now. There's a really useful application for the fire service to check that um, smoke alarms work. And while they're in the house to check that the, cur the carpet hasn't got too slippery on the stairs and that Karen's elderly mum's slippers haven't got too shiny from going up and down the stairs and she's become a kind of falls or trip risk. Um, there's a whole load of different data sets you can put together. So different different people across the top. And then down the side, just and those that's just an um, acute example. Um, I've got all that data really easy for me in an acute. Um, not much of that flows through the regional data sets when people have got big care record data sets. And I think at the risk of sort of criticising them a little bit, I think it's easy to think all of the data is going to flow into those when actually it's a relatively thin data set. I think um, a lot of regions have been characterised by investing in large direct care and then linked data set applications, um, usually funded centrally through some GDR, GDE or other sort of funny money which exists. Um, and they're not that detailed. So um, let's not say they're not useful. They're very useful for um, direct care. They're very useful for things like case finding um, and they're useful for, um, you know, producing dashboards of GPs to see if they've done any of the eight diabetes checks that they should have done on, on their patients. But in the case of diabetes, the acute data that flows into them doesn't doesn't record the fact that the patient was diagnosed with diabetes at the hospital. So all you can do is take a group of people um, who were classed as diabetic in GPs and see if they went to hospital. 
Now, they might not have gone to hospital for anything to do with their diabetes. Um, so these things aren't perfect yet, but I think the, those types of issues are not well understood by people more senior than us on this call, but they're quite well understood by people like us. And I think that one of the conundrums in all of this is that quite senior people think, well, I've I've done all this, I've done the linked data set, I've signed that contract with Graphnet, Orion, Cerner, whomever, Optum, can't, you know, I've got nothing for or against any of these people, but I think there's a perception that people think they've done something when they haven't. And I think that is, that's important and that's getting flushed out now. Um, you could start to, um, with the consent model, you could start to let patients put their own data in there. Um, that's interesting. Lots of people are up for that. There's lots of um, small startups that are that can um, show your um, GP data for you, could potentially load it in. Um, what about bringing in staffing data? You know, we, we did a lot of work during COVID looking at people's ethnicity um, at a level of detail below, but beyond what is involved in the census. So taking Karen and Bradley and assigning an ethnicity, and it was far beyond you know, white British, black African Caribbean, Indian, and so on. This was at the level of um, Sri Lankan, Tamil, Polish, Nepalese, uh, Welsh, uh, Romani traveller. Um, and it, it might not be perfect, but it looks pretty accurate. Um, and it allowed us under COPE to see if there were people working in our ITUs that we might have perceived it as being at higher risk of COVID than others crudely black people compared to white people, but in from specific countries. Um, it has huge potential for you to then go out into social marketing. And, you know, I suddenly, I suddenly got called on, dragged onto a call with the vaccines minister um, when they were very concerned that people from certain ethnicities were not taking the vaccine. And the social marketing that was being done kind of worked OK for some people but just didn't work for some others who had a particular religion um, or they perceived there to be meat product in the vaccine or, you know, and it was not as straightforward as just some regular TV advertising. You needed to do something very, very specific through a community group or through a mosque or through a church or a knitting circle, whatever you could kind of get to. Um, so one of the points you might take away from this is that it's easy to think you've done some of this stuff, but you probably haven't done it at a level of detail that you can design some really strong interventions around. So those are the kind of data sets that we've got. Um, there's some waffle on here about what we did before it, which you can you can see when you get the slides. Um, what I've then tried to do is to talk about and this this sort of um, these rows here are quite interesting because they look a bit out of date now um, because the the latest um, description is population health planning and research those are the three things that are kind of appearing everywhere on federated data platform guidance to the gold acre review to lots of things and and you you all know that you know thing, things change and things become the buzzwords those three are the current buzzwords, so they should probably be the rows on here. This is slightly out of date, but it, we just came out of this because there wasn't any guidance. It, it still looks right. It's all the same stuff. They're just different words. Um, and then across the top, what I've started to try and do is to talk about what different people might do. Um, and, you know, the, the people on this call, I think will probably all fall into one of those columns. We've got people from the private sector on, might have people from universities, we've got public health consultants, people from the commissioning support unit and so on. Um, and KMAP there is an idea, and I think this links to one of the wicked problems that people might kind of have a view on, is do you centralise some of your existing team and create a new team? Um, do you all field someone who's available a bit to work on some stuff? Uh, do you allocate people from the CCG down to PCNs? Um, do you invest in a new team or do you prioritise population health type work and do less counting widgets and beans in a hospital and more working collaboratively with GPs on a particular pathway? Um, and what we 
what we put an application in for, which we've got a business case coming together now on, is to start to put together a new team um, that sits at the centre, um, overseen by a chief analytical officer. Um, and um, there was a slide where Karen kept saying expected, as though these things would actually happen. <laughs> um, I hope they do. Um, I'm, I'm called Chief Analytical Officer and we've done, I've done that deliberately to try and make the case nationally that that's what we need. There's only three people with that job title. Um, we need to get to a point where we've got 10, then 50, then 100. Um, so um, I hope you're right, um, but it's it's difficult. Um, the, the CIO world have done quite well at creating a space for themselves and kind of hoovering up money and spending 10 years deciding between CERNA and EPIC when that is not a, that's not an important decision for most people as long as the data flows in and flows out and is right um, I don't really care which American software giant you kind of get into bed with um, and I think there's a model for not having all of your eggs in one basket as well because different data sets work better through I tend to find through a kind of best of breed model um, but, you know, people will have different opinions about some of this stuff. So I think that, that that kind of demonstrates some of the joint working that we kind of want to see happen. And I think we're at a point now where we're, we're really starting to challenge people's existing roles. So I'm paid four, do, four days a week by the hospital and paid one day a week by the CCG as a as a let's try and do something a bit different and something a bit more interesting. And I think we need pressure to move to more of those kind of mixed blended roles um, and also where quite senior people in data have actually feel permission to publish data and not be told by a chief exec or a coup to um, keep it all secret because we don't know, we don't want the other mob knowing what we're up to. We definitely don't want to declare we've got four empty beds because the next trust will send four ambulances down the road. We need to kind of get beyond that culture into a much more joined up one. Um, but this is what we've tr tried to do. And we've we've got we've got resources around all of this if, if it's useful. So we've got strategies and terms of reference documents for boards. Uh, we've got IG documents under joint data control. Uh, we've got plan. We've got a work plan for how we're going to do population health management and so on. But this is what we're we're trying to enable. Um, but this this has been a coalition of the will in. It's been the, the you know, the, I say the Friday afternoon work, the, you know, the Tuesday evening, Saturday morning work is just um, no one pretty much has got a new job in this new world. Um, this is a group of people who think it's really important and are finding time to try and put it together. Um, so we've made quite a bit of progress. We, we certainly haven't finished. Um, that's the kernel. What I have included here, um, you'll get all these, but I've I've given you, I thought these might be useful to show a couple of slides on some of the structure and the governance because people might be interested in this, might have a question on this. Um, I quite like, a few years ago, NHSIE put out these three eyes of kind of, I can't remember what they were, but kind of infrastructure intelligence intervention, so I can remember those three. Um, it, and then And then they talked about things like incentives and interventions and so on. Uh, in my head, we've got five. We've kind of got IG because it's such a big deal, um, infrastructure, intelligence, interventions and incentives. And each of those five things are huge pieces of work which have got um, governance requirements around them. So incentives is all the finance bods getting in a room and going, well, what how, how are we going how are we going to change this if we if we're going to do that virtual outpatients instead of face-to-face -face ones we know those don't cost as much but we don't want to penalize you can we can can we create some shared incentive so that we do more of that virtually or let's take let's take the diabetes pathway specifically let's agree a series of <clears throat> problems and prems and um, best practice tariffs and and just see if we can price things slightly differently. Um, so with those five, I've I've kind of got my hands on three of them, really. Um, I've had to put in place a lot of work around IG. So I've got a data ethics, data access and IG group. I've got an ethics board now, which sits above that. Um, I've got an infrastructure team, so they are um, 
they're going to pull together linked data set, they're going to set it all up in SQL, they're going to build a trusted research environment, they're going to put Power BI and R and Python and Hadoop and all these clever things above it. Um, and then we've got plans around intelligence, and that is things like skills mapping, um, working with people like the CSU, uh, working with people like AFA, working with local skills development agencies, um, potentially sharing people, creating new teams, training people, all of that. Um, so those are the three functions that kind of touch me the most. Um, and I've, I've just listed those here for you as well. I think those are the, if you're starting from scratch, those feel like the ingredients. That's the, that's your that's your menu in your cookbook. I think you need one of each of those and you can call them something different, but I think if you're not doing, if you're not spending time on each of those, there's pro it's probably a problem. Um, I just put a couple of slides together at the end, um, hence no fancy background, but, but probably the most important ones. Um, so in, in no particular order, these, these, these just feel really important uh, for me. Um, the IT crowd, and you can kind of tell who they are because they're all 60 year old men in suits. Um, they're very good at knowing where the money is and you lot are not, and I include myself in that. Um, and you just got to go and fight dirty and get involved in that and just get some money out for SQL licenses or um, Power BI licenses or new servers for R to be installed on. Um, you might want a regular data set flowing in from an EMIS or an Apollo or a GraphNet or so on. Th those are kind of IT um, funded projects and you just got to kind of go and not be naive and try and get your hands on some of that. Um, I, my, my personal experience, it's only a personal opinion, is to not, not buy everything in the same shop. Um, you know, I, I, buy, I buy my underpants in Marks and Spencers, but I don't buy my trains in there um, and I don't buy my lunch in there. Um, and, and so on. They don't sell skis. You know, just you're going to need different things from different people. I think this, the more that you buy from one organization, the quicker you restrict the speed of the development that you want to do. Um, but that's just a personal opinion. Um, the big issue for us at the moment, and it's quite interesting seeing the stuff come out um, from Ming Tang's office about federated data platforms, is that through this summit, it feels like there's going to be some proper um, patient and citizen engagement, which is great. Um, we've put a business case together to do a big project across Kent and Midway through the summer um, to get a few hundred people together, build up a citizens panel. Um, and it can't be lip service, it's got to be proper co-design type work. Um, and interestingly, where we have got some quite small interventions that we've designed, because we've demonstrated very good engagement locally, we haven't had to wait for the big, you know, lumpy, um, you know, let's hire the Excel centre and get a few hundred people in it and hire a film crew and, and all of that. You can actually just go out through your GPs, through your parish councils um, and get on with some of this stuff. You don't always need to wait for someone to get you some money to do something at scale. Um, and, and the last point on here I, I just made, which I kind of made at the beginning, is about IG and it's not it's not as straightforward as what the law says. Um, in that domestic abuse example, the police perceive themselves, which I agree with, um, to have a duty under prevention, um, which is enshrined in law. And that seemed like a solid IG um, footing. That was not agreed with by quite a lot of people in the NHS. So we stepped above that and said that aside, we believe there is an ethical responsibility to link this data because of the risk of domestic abuse, because of lockdown. And the ethics and the morals of it are different to the IG and the law of it. And you need to recognise that and have different groups. The IG people will often think it's up to them to decide if you're allowed to do something or not. It isn't. It's their job to give you their expert opinion, which you can agree with or you can thank them for and note as a risk and then make your own decision. And that's an important distinction. Um, these, these might just be uh, local problems for us. This is last slide, Karen, so I'll stop in a second and um, criticise or challenge or ask anything. Um, th these are these are specific to us, but I suspect they probably resonate with some people. Um, one of the issues that we've got is that the GPs are really up for all of this, but we 
the way that we've um, couched the IG applications, we've sort of ended up writing to them every time we've done something slightly different. Um, and it would be really nice if we said, we're just going to do some stuff. It's called secondary use. We'll let you know each time. We'll give you 10 days to object. Um, but we don't want to keep bothering you with getting you to sign off every single little change that we're going to make. So we're trying to find an IG mechanism where we can broadly say, they can broadly say to us, you can use my data, don't do anything stupid with it, don't sell it, don't lose it, and so on. Um, but don't keep asking them every five minutes for the next application, because I said diabetes was fine, and I meant diabetes and dementia, and anything's fine, so don't then ask me for dementia again. Um, the second one is, and I've, I've sort of made this point a few times, there's a lot of, okay, we've got all the data in one place, you haven't got it in a very detailed way within a graph net or an Orion or whatever. It's coming and it's a great start and you can do case finding and you can count how many people haven't had the HCA1B check. But um, to my point earlier about you don't even get a diagnosis out of the hospital, you don't get ICD-10 codes or OPCS4 codes. You just know that Karen came in on that day and that she's registered as a diabetic in GP land. That's kind of interesting, but it's it could be more interesting. Um, the big elephant in the room is if we're going to all change our jobs or not. And it's kind of up to you to decide if you want to sort that out or you want to let someone else tell you what the answer is, or you want to just carry on saying it's really, really busy in my day job, which is where most people are. And I think any sort of goodwill and stamina that people had has been eroded over the last couple of years. Um, so that's quite that's quite a challenge, actually, if we're going to organise ourselves slightly differently. Um, you know, the CSU seems like a kind of a luxury in a sense because you you can devote all of your time to this. If you're working in a hospital or working in a council or working in a CCG, you're not kicking your heels looking for work to do. So if someone tells you to concentrate on something else, you need to figure out what you're going to do a bit less of. So, and I think that's that's quite a challenge. It'll be interesting to see what people do about that. Um, HCPs and PCNs are going to want analytical capability. Um, there's there's far too many of them um, to have their own analyst. So we need to think about self-service as a model. Um, we need to, we're designing an evaluation framework um, for our PCNs to use. So we'll have a kind of a like a village elders that they can come to and say, I'm going to do this thing. And we'll say, that sounds great. How are you going to evaluate it? And they'll say, I don't know what evaluation means. And I'll say, that's OK, I'll tell you now how you're going to do it. Oh, we'd like to do this, a randomised controlled. OK. That's starting to sound OK. What resource have you got? And we'll sort of coach them through that. Um, but that's challenging because there's a lot of them and there's not many of us. Um, as I said at the beginning, we need to develop some sort of strategy for trusted research environments. Um, there's some very interesting work going on um, with things like federated learning, where you know the, the success of the the work, the open safely that Ben Goldacre did is that the, the data didn't really move and people kind of liked that and trusted it and felt quite comfortable with that. Um, trying to replicate that everywhere is possible, but is difficult and is different to what we thought we might do. Um, and then the last one is you might have historic data sets, you might have data sets from the council that haven't got NHS numbers on them. You might have data from the police, which definitely hasn't got an NHS number on. Um, you're into fuzzy logic, you're into what we can do about historical data. Um, how are we going to wait for the centre to come up with the DID re-ID tool or are we going to come up with something ourselves? Are we going to use the free Nottingham open source method? There's some quite crunchy decisions that people will need to make and I, I would love you to not just wait for the centre to deliver all of this, even though they keep saying they will, because I think you'll just wait too long. I'd encourage you to get on with it and, you know, seek permission or you know seek forgiveness rather than permission and but you you will get told off if you do that a bit so um i respect people for not rushing to do that 